Dear friends in West Ohio, greetings again in Christ Jesus. Thanks for the opportunity to visit with you for a few moments this evening. Cynthia and I continue to be delighted to serve among you, and we are just pinching ourselves even as we were talking at breakfast this morning about how long we have been in West Ohio. This is our longest assignment, and I assure you that my next assignment, our next assignment and posting will be outside of itineration and Episcopal ministry. But right now, we're along for the ride and we're enjoying the journey. When we have been physically together for annual conference just two years ago, can you imagine that? Uh, we have been able to recognize both uh, myself, but more especially and more importantly, Cynthia. And I am grateful to her for 45 years of marriage and wedded bliss. So. <laughs> I don't think she knew she was going to be on camera. And uh, had I told her in advance, it would have taken her that much longer to get ready to come out today. But I wanna thank you, dear, as I join and lead the people of West Ohio in thanking you for your remarkable faith, your life in Christ through prayer, your leadership, and most of all, your support of me that allows me to, ins to an, an allows me to serve the people of West Ohio and of the United Methodist Church, and as it has through every local church setting where we were stationed together. Your faith and your constancy are an inspiration, minute by minute, hour by hour, and day by day. On multiple occasions, dear friends, it has been my joy to thank all of you for the fabulous way in which you have pivoted, adapted, and innovated, especially in the last 15 months. You have been remarkable in your perseverance. I am awed and I am humbled when I look at and think about all that you and we have gotten done in this season of crises when we have managed and juggled and made our way through, at least in part, multiple pandemics, some more of the natural order and others of the human-made kind. My gratitude for what I see in local church settings and other ministry settings about how you have navigated this is also joined by my gratitude and my sense of awe and humility when I look at what our conference staff, uh, those both at 32 Wesley Boulevard in Worthington and our deployed staff in the districts, at our campsites, and in innumerable ministry settings. Thank you to each of you and all of you. And speaking of assignments, of pivoting, of nimbleness, a couple of weeks ago, you received word from me that I would be taking on an additional short-term assignment, namely to provide Episcopal oversight for the Illinois Great Rivers Conference from July 1 of this year through December 31 of 2021, while Bishop Beard is on a medical leave. This is not work that I sought. I am fully engaged here in the West Ohio Annual Conference. However, I would want you to know the following. I am an itinerant elder in the United Methodist Church. I happen to be serving as a general superintendent. But I want to underscore, at least for the elders, that I am an itinerant elder. And I trust that those who have taken on holy vows to be itinerant elders. This is not about anything lim limiting other clergy, but itinerant elders have taken on a vow. I know we live out those vows in the midst of other commitments, but we have got to figure out how we move together, and that was implicit and explicit in the cabinet address. So that's number one. Secondly, in light of that, I have never refused the appointment of any bishop nor have I ever refused the assignment 
of the North Central Jurisdiction Committee on Episcopacy and the delegates, lay and clergy, who vote on their recommendation uh, about the assignment of bishops. Now, I'm nothing special. I've got all the warts that everybody else has. I'm merely reciting the record of how I responded when the call came about this additional assignment. The other thing that sobered me is, and that you need to know, I'm not the only United Methodist Bishop serving more than one conference. For some bishops, they know nothing else, especially our colleagues in the central conferences who serve multiple annual conferences. Three is the minimum. I think of the colleagues in the Philippines, most of whom have four and five annual conferences. I think of my colleague, Bishop Patrick Streit of Central and Southern Europe, who has United Methodist conferences that are spread across 14 at least sovereign nations. What I'm doing, friends, is no big deal. This is not about inflating this. This is about letting some air into the room. This is no big deal. When I see myself in league with these colleagues who labor across national boundaries, political boundaries, so forth and so on, and to speak nothing of the clergy of this annual conference who serve multiple point charges and the congregations that are on multiple point charges have been forever and ever, amen, and may be into the future. So you, West Ohio, are not the only bishop, or not the only conference that is, is sharing a bishop in this particular season. Further, both the West Ohio Conference and the Illinois Great Rivers Conference have superb staff and excellent volunteer leaders. This is, a, this is the connection at its best. When the need is there, we can respond in faith. And dare I say with thanksgiving, which is why I was so humbled by the video we had from Sister Betty in North Katanga about joy and hope in the midst of suffering. There's nothing about this in which I consider that I am suffering or that Cynthia is suffering. We are honored and privileged to serve, and in this case, to serve again for a short while, a conference that loved us at least as much as you do. What a privilege to literally widen the circle of prayer for Bishop Frank and Mrs. Melissa Beard as they adjust to some new health realities for Bishop Beard. I assured Bishop Beard by voicemail today that I was widening the prayer circle ever so wide across our nearly 1,000 churches and asking all of you to join me in this season, not only in praying for the Illinois Great Rivers Conference, but specifically for the Beards that they will have positive outcomes, they will make the necessary adjustments, and in turn have asked those folks to be praying for you in West Ohio. I count on you to pray for the Beards and for the Saints in Great Rivers as they are already praying for you. Finally, just this section. Don't get excited. I'm not done yet. I want to quote our sister in the Lord, from centuries ago, Julianne of Norwich, in her Revelations of Divine Love, where she said a lot, but this phrase that leaps out, all shall be well, and she says again, all shall be well. And she continues, and all manner of things shall be well. What a way to live, what a way to pray. I want to turn quickly to a word about our theme for this annual conference. You have heard it multiple times already today about perseverance and about the readings from Hebrews. You'll hear it not only in these next few moments, but uh, across our time tomorrow. That is by design and with every bit of intention. So hear these words again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight 
and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that's where our capstone verses ended in terms of setting the theme for this annual conference, but not the message of the preacher in Hebrews. Here, verses three and four. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Several hundred of you, I understand, really nearly a thousand, have taken the time to listen in part or in whole to the audio version of part one of this year's Episcopal Address. The good news of that, whether you liked it or didn't like it, whether you heard it or didn't heard it, it will make this part of it, part two, a lot shorter. But thank you for tuning in. Sometimes Episcopal addresses here and throughout our annual conferences have been used in a variety of ways. Sometimes to paint a narrative based on statistical data. Sometimes to cast a vision for some new or big direction or project to be undertaken. Sometimes to rehearse all of the good that the organization, in this case, the annual conference, has accomplished in the past. You have experienced all of these. Today, I want to use my remaining time to simply raise three missional questions for our continued pondering for the next season. I have no expectation that they can be answered today or tomorrow. My hope is that if they are anywhere near being some of the right questions that we need to ask and answer, that we will answer them with our lives, with our life together, and with the ministry that we do together in this annual conference. Our text says, if you go to the King James Version, in the uh, 12th chapter of Hebrews, it begins by saying, wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. The other translations have, have dropped some of the formality of the wherefore. And that notion of seeing, wherefore, seeing that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I want to stick a quarter in the meter and just stop there for a moment. And the first question is on this wise. I ask you, and the question is asked of me, do I see all of those around me who are sharing this journey of missional ministry, who are walking with Jesus, who are engaging their discipleship. And what I want to underscore is the question of seeing. When the writer or preacher put these words together, albeit we get it in the English version in a variety of translations, he or she picked up after that long litany in chapter 11, the Faith Hall of Fame, and it talked descriptively about varying ways in which men and women of the faith had lived out their lives in faithfulness and lived by faith. And brings us right to the stage of saying, in effect, in the light of this and of all of these, wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, Seeing 
that we are not alone. So I ask you, do you see the others both mystically and mysteriously? Some who are no longer on terra firma but dwell with the saints in light? Do you see them? Do you see the people who are your partners in ministry in all of the settings where you practice your ministry? Or do you see yourself running this race alone? Are we alone? Could you ever run a race like this if you were truly alone? Do we really believe that God and the saints are with us, or are we mostly functional atheists and we think it's all about us and all up to us? Or back to seeing, do we see our neighbors? Do we see our communities? Do we see the struggles of people near and far who are crying out for life and for opportunities to thrive? Or let me go on in the text, where the text invites us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the one who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Do we really see Jesus? Or as the Reverend Suzanne Allen said in her homily at the clergy session on May the 19th, in reflecting on this text, are we merely glancing at Jesus? Are we taking a look at Jesus every now and again? Oh yeah, he's a good reference point. Or as the text invite, invites us, do we see him and are our eyes fixed on Jesus. Dr. David Pacini, who just took his retirement from the faculty of the Candler School of Theology at Emory University, one of our United Methodist seminaries, said in a recent conversation where I was humbled to be in the midst with him who was speaking to about a half dozen of us by invitation of one of my Episcopal colleagues, and he began to talk with us about the future and, and some of the things that were hindering our life in the church, our life in this nation, our life in seeking justice and righteousness in the world. And this brilliant theologian <laughs> said something so profound but so simply that one could not miss it. And I've not been able to shake it now for almost three months. He said, that it was his conviction that the root of all of our sin was actually a failure to see. And then he went into and invited us into a discussion about all of the things that we don't see or the ways in which we wrongly see, for example, our neighbors, but we don't see them as neighbors, we see them as commodities. <laughs> He said that all of our sin can be rooted in our failure to see. Occasionally, someone will say to me something like, thank you, Bishop, for seeing me. Hmm. We all need to be seen. And we need to know that we are seen. Not so much with the scrutiny that gives us, gives us a sense of nervousness like we might stumble, fall, and fail. Not as if God or anyone else is waiting for us to fail, but that people are looking on us in hope and expectation that we actually succeed. The saints that surround us, the angels Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high, is looking upon us, is seeing us, and all that is pouring forth from the balconies of glory, but also with the people around us who are our partners in ministry, is the hope and the expectation that we'll actually be faithful and that we will persevere. I see you. I know I am seen. And while that may have an element of scrutiny about it, I am reassured that I'm not alone. 
and I see Jesus. Though perhaps not always as clearly as I ought to. And sometimes I can hardly keep my gaze on him. Because living up to being who he needs me to be seems so difficult. And yet everything I need to be what he's asked me to be, I've already seen in his life, his death, and his resurrection. And sometimes I see it in you, the saints of West Ohio around me, when you act in such just and charitable and generous and kind and faithful ways. Thanks be to God. Let's see one another. And so I ask you, who do you see on the journey? The text goes on to say, let us lay aside every sin and weight that clings so closely. So the question is, what are we willing to get rid of in order to really be the church that Jesus needs in this hour? Let us lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily, so, so clings to us so closely, that encumbers us, that holds us back that makes us stumble and fall. You, you may train with weights around your ankles for the great race, but you don't run the race with them on. Any weights that you and I have on in the race of faith, life, and discipleship are mostly self-imposed. <laughs> but sometimes they are socially imposed. And so the question of what are we willing to lay aside to get rid of in order to really be the church is teased out with the following. Can we release West Ohio, United Methodists, Christians? Can we release our idolatries and false gods, which all too often are our opinions and our addictions to having things our way. Could we lay aside that sin and wait? Or maybe our greatest sin is our stuckness. When we say we've never done it that way before, let me tell you, in the last 15 months, you've been doing stuff you never thought you would do or could do, and you found you needed to do it or you would have been less than faithful. Could the sin and weight we need to lay aside be our stuckness on ourselves and the way in which we've been doing things in ministry, not just in the local church, but in the United Methodist Church and in the churches writ, writ, large, writ large. If we pay attention to the data of what makes people engage, come and go, whether virtually or physically, all of the messages and the signs are there. But until we can release our false gods and get our eyes back on Jesus, we will always be encumbered with sin and weight that will keep us from going as fast or as far as we need to go. Had the apostolic church not adapted, just read the book of Acts, we might never be here. Had they never adapted, had they never pivoted, had they never innovated, after all, the whole Jesus movement and the church was a pivot, an adaptation, and an innovation on some things that had come before and they represented new things, but they poured out of the heart of God that had been yearning for that kind of people across the generations. In verse 3 of Hebrews 12, we find these words. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. In your struggle against sin, 
You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now, this is not about our being macabre. But it is a part of keeping our eyes on Jesus and actually reflecting upon how much he gave, how much he suffered in order that we might have the encouragement to not give up, to grow weary, or to lose heart. The encouragement to persevere, or as Brother Harper just said, the encouragement to keep going through, to press our way. So in our struggle, we have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. When I think about some of those in the Hall of Fame in chapter 11, when I think of people in generations before me and their struggles just to be treated like human beings in this nation, just to exercise their faith, to speak nothing of going globally, I'm saying I've got it so easy it's embarrassing. It doesn't actually cost you and me here in the Western Hemisphere, in the United States of America, in a formerly mainline denomination. It doesn't cost us much to say we're Christians. There's no threat to our lives to which I say shame, shame, shame. We ought to be doing work that is so important that our lives would be threatened because we had so upset the status quo of the principalities and powers that are at work in this world subjugating people and inflicting continuous suffering upon them. No, I have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. And may I confess to you, I pray sometimes that I never have to shed blood for Jesus. Shame on me. To look in the face of the one who gave so much for all of us that I should be less than willing to suffer for his cause. The hymn writer said, am I a soldier of the cross? A follower of the Lamb? It's a question that I still need to answer. Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative says that our work in changing the world, that sometimes it requires us to do uncomfortable things. This is one of his four pillars of doing justice work. <laughs> and we should, in doing those uncomfortable things expect pushback. In other words, as we persevere in doing good things and pick up on Paul's admonition to the Galatians not to grow weary in doing what is right, we should expect that there will be resistance. But when I go to the gym and lift weights that shouldn't be able to be lifted, it is the resistance that makes me stronger. It is the resistance that keeps my loins girded up. It is the resistance that sharpens my resolve and renews, renews my commitment to the task. So in doing the work of Jesus, in doing the work of justice and righteousness and salvation and peace, we are called upon to do some uncomfortable things and we need only look at these verses in Hebrews 12, 3 and 4. <laughs> and ask of ourselves, to what lengths are we willing to go for the sake of the mission? For justice to spring forth, for everybody in this world to have enough of many of the things that some of us have the privilege of taking for granted. And so in our work of perseverance, I leave you with these three questions. I cite no statistics tonight. I paint no grand vision and offer no big project for you to take up. This is project enough. Do you see who is with you on the journey? What are you willing to get rid of 
in order to really be the church? And to what lengths are you willing to go for the sake of the mission of Jesus Christ in the world? In the name of God, who creates, who redeems, and who sustains us by God's own Holy Spirit. Amen.